I'm really happy to be here, and I'm going to talk to you about something kind of weird called Poetic Innovation for Social Change. Um, so we've been talking about design thinking throughout this series, and that's really what this is going to drill down to, too, but hopefully in a kind of new perspective, blending poetry with social impact and design as well. It's something I've been thinking about for quite some time, but haven't had the opportunity to articulate it until today, so it's pretty exciting. Um, so to start, I'm going to talk a little bit about my work. I'm going to try to fly through it so that we can get into the, the meaty stuff, but a little bit of m the evolution of, of my work as a designer and how I even see design in general as well. Uh, then we're going to talk about poetics and social impact, uh, and then the uses for poetry and social impact, and we're going to write some poems. Cool. Yeah. See, I told you, it's not stressful. <laughs> this is not a stressful session. <laughs> so my, I started my career in 2005, and so I just hit my 10 year this year. Um, and really, two different things happened. Uh, and it kind of easily breaks into five-year segments, so I'm going to talk about it in that way. But one thing that goes throughout is my company, Very Nice. So first I'm going to introduce what we do, um, and, then, and then we'll kind of dig into that some more. So every year in the United States alone, nonprofits are spending $8 billion on design and marketing services, um, aka people like me. Um, and I don't know about you, but this figure really frustrates me because I like to imagine what the world might look like if all of those uh, expenditures could actually be reallocated towards the cause itself. You know, what kind of impact could actually happen in that world? Um, to me, that's where things like hunger, housing, water access, these really persistent problems, et cetera, um, could be solved basically not by doing that much extra work, but just by taking stuff that we already exist, that we already have, and putting it somewhere else. This is where pro bono comes in, which is short for pro bono publico and literally means for the good of the public. Uh, I got my start as a pro bono practitioner when I was able to do stuff like that when I was 16. Um, I met a man at the skate park in Sunnyvale in the Bay Area where I grew up, and he was in a wheelchair. And he was ripping around the park far better than I and anybody else. He even did a flip over one of the transitions. And so obviously I was really intrigued and I wanted to roll closer to this guy and see what was going on. And it turned out that he was uh, the founder of a nonprofit that taught children in wheelchairs how to participate in extreme sports. So he wasn't alone that day. He was with a bunch of little kids who were also ripping around. It was really inspiring. And the first thing I could think to do was essentially uh, don't ask, ask if I could help in some way. And the first, you know, I didn't have any money, so thought, oh, well, I just got a pirated copy of Photoshop. Maybe I can design some stickers for this guy. And that became my first uh, pro bono project. <laughs> after that, I got hooked. And a few years afterwards, I established Very Nice uh, in 2008. And we're now a design innovation and uh, strategy consulting firm that gives half of its work away for free to nonprofits. We work with a really wide range of clients. Half of them are nonprofits. The other half tend to be startups because startups and nonprofits both essentially have nothing. <laughs> and we really thrive kind of dabbling in a little bit of everything in a design project, but also with some larger accounts as well. Um, the work really ranges from anywhere from commissioned artwork to apps and digital products to installations to brands to social media campaigns to print publications, workshops where I pop balloons, um, and, and so on. And we've been able to donate over $2.5 million worth of services over these last uh, seven or so years. So. As I mentioned, that's something that really spans all of this time, pretty much, in terms of building up to Very Nice and kind of the mission of what we do. But really from 2005 to 2010, I was really interested in making kind of really pretty designs or really more on that, more on the side of design of really trying to make really sweet posters, logos, websites, and so on. So this is some of that stuff. Skateboard decks, of course. More posters. But then, you know, there was this point, and this was right around the time when I started learning about design thinking kind of stuff, or maybe, maybe before that word, you know, but just like design as strategy type of work. Um, around that time, I started to feel a little bit 
I don't know, a little bit antsy, I guess, with the type of work I was doing. Uh, and I was approaching my final class at UCLA in undergrad, and we were able to do a project, any kind of project we wanted. Um, and my solution was to basically teach myself how to ride the unicycle while playing the mandolin simultaneously. That was the project I wanted to do. So it's two things that I've always wanted to learn in my life, and I decided, you know what, I'm gonna take 10 weeks to do it and document it. I ended up making a zine and so on. Um, but what I kind of didn't know at this point is this was really my entry point into being very interested in the aspect of design that is constraint. So working under constraints uh, to create things and to create narratives and so on. So after that, after 2010, I ended up going to Art Center for grad school and jumping off of that interest in constraints and communication and so on, I started looking into things like the songs of the Underground Railroad, Hobo Code, the way that people communicate um, online in different mobile games and so on and how that's limited but how you can still be creative. Uh, and I decided to walk around one day with a necklace that predetermined different phrases that I could say to try to live in that kind of constrained mindset. Even took it as far as trying to recreate a mobile game in real life um, where I had my friends uh, not allowed to talk, essentially. <laughs> they, had to, they had to play with these different gifts and they had to text me if they wanted to say something and then I would say it to the group. So really playing with that idea of constraining uh, communication and censorship and so on. Uh, but then, you know, I didn't really want to necessarily keep going down this route of playful, let's make games happen in real life kind of thing. So I started making these machines. Uh, and these machines were illustrations that uh, essentially represented machines that limit your communication. Um, so this, for example, can sense different sign language um, and, and, you know, in theory, uh, limit that. And these are worksheets. So basically my thought was, oh, you know, the, the Occupy movement's happening right now. What if I make worksheets and do a workshop, you know, in front of City Hall in L.A. and have people try to break these machines that I'm presenting them with new sort of innovative ideas for startups or services or products? And ended up getting a lot of really interesting results and conversations, too. Um, I was really interested in the in the kind of language of the entrepreneurial community when I was working on my thesis. Um, so for example, you know, the word disruption, how that can mean something so different to these Occupy campers than it does to people on Sand Hill Road. Um, I really liked that balance. But then again, you know, hit kind of a wall and then I went for a walk and I ended up making up this game while I was on a walk where I would walk a hundred steps, take a picture of the first non-living thing that I saw that would be my product. Walk another hundred steps, take a picture of the first living thing I saw, that would be my market. Walk another hundred steps, take a picture of the place that I'm in, that would be my location or my industry. So this was a business that I created on a walk, which is park benches for dogs at railroad stations. Mm -hmm. And I liked this kind of generative, generative uh, business making. Uh, and I liked how sometimes when I would do this, it would be really absurd, sort of like this or very plausible, or actually sometimes kind of offensive. <laughs> um, but then I also liked the, the possibility of actually using this as a design prompt to really design the perfect park bench for dogs at railroad stations. What does it mean to design that? Took it one step further, turned it into a card game where people had to fill out a business plan. Um, ended up working with the city of Merced to do it on more of a community level. Then I started thinking, okay, you know, like, what if I really automate this and start making it even more machine-like? And so this is a workshop where people press a button and then the, their kind of tools that they have to play with to invent their business is populated on the screen. Making it one more step, I wrote an algorithm to generate a thousand business plans. Um, some, again, some are gibberish, some kind of make sense and so on. And then I mailed all of them to all of the top VC firms um, to see if I would actually get any response, which I didn't. <laughs> um, that work was all exhibited as part of my, my graduate show. Um, but then, you know, the work that I'm doing right now, that it, really, it really plays on this work I was doing uh, while I was at Art Center in the sense that it's very workshop oriented. Um, some of the stuff that we'll do today are a little bit of of the work that I do with our clients, for example, 
At Very Nice, my role has shifted to global strategy lead, so I only handle strategy stuff. Um, I don't do any creative direction or anything like that anymore. So I've totally made this kind of conscious um, shift in, in the design industry. Something exciting we're doing right now is we're working with Google to, to help them lead a pro bono initiative of their own, um, which has 100 employees uh, engaged in it. So that's been a really exciting thing for an app that's coming out. There's been talk about civic innovation fellowships. This is um, a different civic innovation fellowship that I started launching last year with the controller's office, where we have a, a fellow working from their office there doing some stuff around data too. So that's something that we should talk about also with what you guys are doing. Um, I wrote a book called How to Give Half of Your Work Away for Free, where I was really interested in open sourcing our business plan. Two, three, four, five, six. Um, so that other people could do it too. Maybe even you guys. So do only so, us have to pay for this? No, no, it's all, it's all free for you guys. Um, because what, what started to happen, and this is really where my passion is now, is uh, all these, you know, like thousands of practitioners would reach out and say, hey, how do you do pro bono work like you do? And I ended up mentoring a lot of them. Uh, and now there's dozens of businesses all over that give half. And we've started this kind of new movement in pro bono among smaller businesses. Aside from that, my other big pet project, which I hope you guys will check out, is called Models of Impact, uh, which is an interactive map that displays every business model and social enterprise. Um, and then I'm starting to turn it into a game, too. I've gotten really obsessed with dice lately. Um, we're going to use dice today, too. Uh, but I just really love, I love this like generative quality. And hopefully that kind of answers this question, but you're still probably wondering why is this guy talking, going to talk to you about poetry? Um, and really, it's, it, it, it does stem from that interest in constraint as a method for making, which is something that's massive in poetry. Um, but I think the best way to answer this is to even pick this apart. What is poetic innovation for social change? To start, so poetic, you know, the best way that it's ever been explained to me is it really comes down to four things. And that is it's observant, it's empathetic, it's serendipitous, and it's constrained. So with observant, the person that I always think of is Lawrence Ferlinghetti, which any of the San Francisco people in the room might know. He's the founder of City Light Books. Uh, and he's one of the most observant poets that I've ever read. Meaning, you know, he really has spent his whole life in San Francisco just watching stuff, occasionally complaining about it, um, and occasionally loving it as well. So I want to read one, one poem that gets at that. It's called In Golden Gate Park That Day. So in, Go in Golden Gate Park that day, a man and his wife were coming along through the enormous meadow which was the meadow of the world. He was wearing green suspenders and carrying an old beat up flute in one hand, while his wife had a bunch of grapes, which she kept handing out individually to various squirrels, as if each were a little joke. And then the two of them came on through the enormous meadow, which was the meadow of the world, and then at a very still spot where the trees dreamed and seemed to have been waiting through all time for them, they sat down together on the grass without looking at each other and ate oranges without looking at each other, and put the peels in a basket, which they seemed to have brought for that purpose, without looking at each other. And then he took his shirt off and his undershirt off, but kept his hat on sideways, and without saying anything, fell asleep under it. And his wife just sat there looking at the birds, which flew about calling to each other in the stilly air as if they were questioning existence or trying to recall something forgotten. But then finally, she too lay down flat and just lay there looking up at nothing, yet fingering the old flute, which nobody played, and finally looking over at him without any particular expression except a certain awful look of terrible depression. <laughs> so it's a pretty depressing poem, but I think it's a really great example of observation in poetry. Empathetic also. Um, so the screen's a little bit dark, but when I think of empathy, I, I always think of this poem by William Carlos Williams, um, which you guys have might have heard, The Red Wheelbarrow. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. So to me, that's the ultimate expression of appreciation or forgetting to appreciate, um, which I think really, really brings up this idea of empathy. 
there's another, I, I made a note to myself here, there's another poet, Lo, Luis uh, Gluck, who, Gluck? Okay, Gluck. Gluck or Gluck, one of those. Explore, she explores her feelings on heaven and on these ideas of mortality by basically trying to see the issue and writing about the issue through the eye of a friend. Um, so that's kind of another activity where she's really trying to embody this really empathetic process to discuss these things. Serendipitous. So when you think of serendipity, you definitely think of Jack Kerouac, who kind of popularized uh, this, this idea of, of automatism. It's so like automatic writing, where it's the belief that your subconscious has these words and your, your hand is kind of just a route to put those on the paper. Um, so he, this is a really great book, by the way, the book of sketches, where basically he just was sitting at bars or outside coffee shops and just saying whatever he's going to say. Um, Oscar Wilde, ah, this is all the Jack London Gray. Deep, dark stairways, blood mahogany, bums sit around, one man at bar, talk across 50-foot lobby. Once a great splendor is now mutter hall of hobos. Clerk at sumptuous desk paces and whistles, bums huddle in gray entrance to smoke and see out. Hands of pockets rattle rasp of a truck out there. I sense the gray, cold tragedy of end's boyhood. Enjoy its joy, too, as he showeth. Don't really know what that's about, but you're not really supposed to. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, constrained. Constrained is the fourth. Uh, when you think of constrained in poetry, you think of the Uli Po, which is this French, uh, French group of mathematicians who are really interested in how math can, um, can sort of inform or create new methodologies for poetry to thrive in. One of their most famous uh, methods is snowball poetry where essentially each word in the poem gradually gets more and more letters. Uh, and, it's, and it's like this. I am the text which begins sparely assuming magnitude, constantly, perceptibly, proportional, incorporating unquestionable incrementations. <laughs> so then next on our list is innovation. So what is innovation? Oh, surprise. So there's these four things. It's observant. It's empathetic, it's serendipitous, and it's constrained. Observant innovation. So in the background here is a picture of Velcro shoes. Um, the way that Velcro was invented is the, the inventor was actually on a hike, uh, and some little burrs got stuck to his shoes. And instead of being like any of us and just flicking them off, he took the shoe home totally intact uh, and studied how that was happening. And that's how he came up with the method to create Velcro completely from observation. Empathetic. Um, so a lot of innovation is, is really informed by the needs of the customer or the needs of the user. Uh, in the background here, you can barely see, but it's uh, an a image of a company called Oblong, which their founder actually was, was really the pioneer of that minority report kind of interface, that gestural interaction work. And they're actually building it. And, it's such a new kind of technology that they're constantly doing these user studies and having people come in and see, you know, okay, how's it feeling to use this device and your hands in this way and so on. So very much an empathetic process. Serendipitous. So the story of the guy that invented the post-it note, he invented it on accident. He was basically, I'm not sure if he was actually working for a glue company, but he was making glue and he ended up making glue that accidentally wasn't sticky. Um, at all, <laughs> or not, not permanent at least, and that, that kind of accidentally led down to this road of creating the post-it note, which is basically glue that's not too sticky. Now, I had always heard that story. He was working for 3M and singing in his choir and was having problems with his notes falling out. Oh, he nice. something to be able to mark, but he didn't want them all over the floor. Nice. Yeah. That, and I don't know, maybe mine is apocryphal as opposed to truth, but <laughs> You never know, but at the, at the end of the day, ser serendipitous mm -hmm. discovery happens all the time. Um, and then constrained, of course. I, I think it's not, a, it's not on accident that around the time of 2008, when the economy was going to hell, paper prototypes became kind of a really big thing in mainstream innovation, where you would test out app ideas, website ideas, just by drawing it on a piece of paper and having people poke at it instead of spending a bunch of money trying to, uh, trying to actually make it. 
And then we have social change. So I wonder what social change might be. You might, you might have noticed a little pattern. So it's observant, it's empathetic, it's serendipitous, and it's constrained. Um, observation, this, this comes up all the time in ethnography, which is a big part of social change projects. You know, hosting interviews, watching from afar how people react to different interventions, and so on. It's a, it's a big, a crucial first step. Empathetic, so this is uh, a good example of the company called IDEO that you guys have probably all heard of, Innovation Consultancy. They were contacted by a major hospital to make the patient experience a little bit more fun or a little bit more pleasant. And instead of thinking, oh, let's throw a plant in the corner or let's throw a mural up on the wall, they decided to strap a camera to their head and spend the day as a patient. And what they found is that something like 98% of the time you're actually looking up at the ceiling. Uh, and so they ended up proposing to do something really cool on the ceiling. And, and you don't really come to that kind of idea without empathy and social change. Serendipitous. There's a lot of stories like this, but Tom's is really well known. You know, the guy's basically on vacation outside of the U.S. and notices that kids don't have shoes and is inspired to solve that problem. So a lot, a lot of that, and that kind of ties back to observation as well, but, but kind of being open-minded to these types of solutions uh, and not necessarily going with the first thing you would assume a community might need is a really big piece of, of social change projects. And then, of course, constraint. Constraint comes up a lot when you're talking about money in these kinds of projects. But another is, which I think is really interesting, is when you're working uh, in developing countries that have a constraint of technology. Um, and so there's a lot of really great examples. One that we just, we just finished, or we're still kind of working with UNICEF, uh, on a project called U-Report, which is a reporting system that uses the mobile SMS platform. And so it's this kind of thing of, you know, how can we make the most use out of the least amount of technology and internet access and so on. So you heard me blab a little bit. I figure I should put some quotes up by some smart people. Um, this is Daniel Erasmus who says, our future is as much threatened by the lack of imaginative connection making as it is from a dearth of engineers or mathematicians. John Coleman of the Harvard Business Review says, poetry teaches us to wrestle with and simplify complexity. I really love that. And then Sydney Harmon, who is quoted by the New York Times, but she's kind of a big time CEO. She says, I used to tell, or he, sorry, he, I used to tell my senior staff to get me poets as managers. Poets are our original systems thinkers. They look at our most complex environments and they reduce the complexity to something they begin to understand. So it's not just me saying this stuff. Go back to the first one yeah, sure. Yeah, no problem. Photo op. All right, thanks. And so to me, I really believe that poetry is this constant attempt to make a lot of the stuff that's happening in our lives, so a lot of our observations, our serendipitous encounters, conversations, our memories, really appear linear. And what I mean by that is really presenting them on the same playing field and trying to observe things in a new way that way and find these interesting patterns. Um, poetry gives me the ability to appreciate very mundane things. I love that you can write an entire poem about my sleeve, you know? Um, create within rigid structure, make without a set income, outcome, <laughs> set income, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that was a Freudian slip. And then four uh, is, of course, be weird. So now we have a few activities, which I think is good timing because it's hopefully still before Mark has to leave. <laughs> so I want us to do, to each to write a poem uh, that is about each of these four things. So observant, empathetic, and it's spelled wrong there, not intentionally, although maybe it was intentional. Um, serendipitous and constrained. So I have one activity for each of these. You guys will need paper and pen um, for the first couple you can just use your own notebooks so we don't have to rip stuff out yet um, and yeah so let me go ahead and get started with the first one so observant so and just run with it some of this stuff's going to feel a little bit weird but but just run with it and think back to to how we compared each of these uh each of these concepts to social change and to design thinking and to innovation and so on so the first is observant what i want you guys to do is close your eyes 
and move your head around slowly. I said slowly so nobody gets injured for about 10 seconds or until I say stop. And then you'll, what you'll do is you'll take note of the first person, place, or thing that you see, and you'll write a run-on sentence about it for 60 seconds or until I say stop. So go ahead and start moving your head around slowly. And stop. And open them. So whatever that first person, place, or thing is, start writing. And don't think too much. Is it all three or just one of the three? Just one of those, yeah. Okay, and stop. Any volunteers to read their, read their run on? Yeah? All right. <laughs> Straight lines converge, all coming from elsewhere, meet together for the purpose of creating shape and space. Circles approach to eliminate. All right. And what was that about? That was about the. That corner, I hit that corner. Awesome. Awesome. I love it. Great. Anybody else want to want to volunteer? Yeah. This desk is brown and cold. Looks like I could enjoy laying on it to feel a bit cooler since it's pretty hot outside. Nice, <laughs> nice, nice. I love it. Yeah, I love like this kind of mixture of of ops like what are you seeing and in, in writing about in a poetic way, and then what are you what are you kind of feeling based on what you're seeing? That's that's sort of that's sort of what's happening. How about one one more volunteer? Yeah. I have a back black of a chair that people sit in and out they come and sit down and learn, but I hear lights out, lights on, gone. But me here in this corner on the chair on the back of the chair reflecting. Nice. So then then you took it another route, which is sort of giving life to the thing that you saw. It became a person. Um, so I want to do this one more time. And then we heard from three people, so we'll hear from three more maybe. <laughs> so go ahead and close your eyes. Do the same thing. You guys look so funny. <laughs> I think I will. Just a little bit longer so that I can get this picture. And stop. Okay, so take note of that first person, place, or thing that you see and start writing. And stop. All right. So how about you, Mark? You want to start? Okay. So I, I walked in on that maximum occupancy. Oh, nice, <laughs> nice. <laughs> maximum occupancy, 28. Why 28? Why not 27 or 29? What's the minimum? How does one occupy a room? Why a sign? Why there? Why that typeface? All caps, not lowercase. Nice. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So you, you started to question reality. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, that's a, it's really interesting to land on something that already has words and use that as sort of a jumping off point. It's really cool. Yeah, why there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it does. Just everybody stand in rows. <laughs> Who wants to go next? So I lock in on George. So George is shooting with red light flickering and telling him and me that the camera is rolling and he's taking it all in, it, uh, as is so often the case in so many situations. Nice, nice, love it. Is that pretty accurate to what you're doing, George? You know, it's pretty darn well. Nice, and then. Yep, um, Alex. Uh, <clears throat> um, a ribbon of light threaded with industrial care, transparent slides like that of an old machine. The desk caked on, waiting as we hear stories that play out. Nice. Nice. That's great. Yeah, it was a, what was it? Yeah. Nice, uh, nice. Very cool. Yeah, no, I like, I like that some of you went, it really felt like poetry already you know just based on that jumping off point it it just kind of makes me think what i always get really inspired by is what if they're like what if every single pixel in this room had something like what you guys created it would be such a such a gift to the world you know 
be pretty crazy. So, um, <laughs> so. Imagine like a picture of this room. Yeah. And then on the other side, it's like a million poems. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Well, that's that's actually why I like doing it inside in a pretty like you know nothing against the space, but like pretty normal kind of room, right? Uh, imagine doing. I feel like it's it would almost be impossible to do this at the Grand Canyon, you know, or to do it in somewhere that's not mundane. I feel like it's a whole another whole another exercise. I definitely invite you guys to actually try that. Go someplace beautiful and try this and compare and see how you felt. Um, in, in terms of in terms of the results um, any any questions about this activity or any other any kind of anecdotes of how it how it might relate to other things you guys have been talking about in these sessions just this idea of observing well this I mean I think I, I mentioned this um, I don't know if you guys heard, but I was talking to Ben about this. He was um, he was on Friday, mm -hmm. and we did a little bit of ethnographic research where we went out and like observed and mm -hmm. kind of like saw stuff out in the courtyard. Mm -hmm. It really reminds me of bye bye. 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 Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, one did not make this scene. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. But I just did. Um, yeah, um, so it, it reminded me. It reminded me of when I was in school, really, and just like having a creative writing class, mm -hmm. creative nonfiction, and having these moments where he would just be like, go out and sit somewhere and then just like write about something, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and really come up with this like brilliant stream of consciousness and like the act of, um, if anyone's done like the artist's way, like having the constraint of time, mm -hmm. like, or needing to do an entire page, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. only having 60 seconds, yeah. you know, yeah. that's yeah. kind of fun, I like that part. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Yes, it's kind of reminded me of, um, I think it was John, or one of the think wrong ideas, like, mm -hmm, or, mm -hmm. um, like, just get out of your own way, just write yeah. this thing, and I'll think, is it good, is it, am I really capturing the essence, just... Yep. Yeah, that's a big, that's a big part of design thinking practices, or, or even just kind of design innovation stuff, is to really just make without necessarily thinking about it, you know, and learn through making, and see what happens, and then... Um, you know, then try to actually understand what did happen, <laughs> but not necessarily limiting yourself in the process to to think about what's happening at that moment. So our, oh yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say too, it, it makes me think about the way in which observation is always an abstraction hmm. yeah. from everything that's going on, right? Yeah. Which is why you have a million different uh -huh. poems on the other side of anything see yeah but you can't help but always just you, you know whatever you focus on it's mm -hmm. like still this great abstraction mm -hmm. it's not mm -hmm. that's also not the reality because the reality is this bigger thing beyond that. yeah what it is you've pulled out i love that yeah i love that yeah we can be looking at the same thing and can be seeing totally different things mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's, that's that's really beautiful so the next one is about being empathetic so with this, this, this might feel a little bit weird, but the idea is to turn to your neighbor, um, to ask them to tell you about the worst day of their life and the best day of their life, and write a series of five haikus that attempt to recall the emotions of those days. Okay. Do you, so if I turn to my neighbor and ask this, do I write about theirs? Yes, you do. Are supposed to write about theirs? You're supposed to buy, write about theirs. Okay. So this is kind of the, the act of trying to go into their shoes mm -hmm. and speak on their behalf almost. And a haiku is five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. So these are really quick and simple. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the five haikus can represent the, uh, it doesn't have to be five about the worst day and five about the best day. It's just the whole, the whole thing combined. Five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. Okay. So, what was the best day of your life? <laughs> well, it, it was actually recent. Oh, cool. I just, um, was spending time with my partner. Yeah. I, uh, sure, I can do, 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 I can do
yeah. yeah. So it was like, even though that's a couple of days in front of that. Yeah, totally, yeah. totally. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think for me, and yeah. I woke up kind of in a similar way. Um, and and it was just rain. So I think it would be over the top. So it'd be easy to say I got married in December. It'd be easy to say that my wedding day was best on my life. See, it's just personal, right? So it's like, right? It's become totally unbalanced. Yeah. We ended up after a ten-year relationship getting so, married. And, okay. and, 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 and I still wake up discussing yet. It's almost time to start writing. So I would I would get the get the writing process. Yeah, we found an anaconda. We like caught an anaconda. It was great. Anyhow. So um, we go back to La Paz, which I want to is called, out, it means peace in Spanish. And, and uh, yard, uh, one of these, the last one, I've always been a photographer, and I, uh, I became a photographer. And these pictures of like, the Amazon you know, rainforest, and the pink dolphins, and all this stuff was on this camera. At that point, I was just very relieved that he had been into the whole design realm. I've always been artistic, but finally I felt like it was something that I could pursue. So. So I'm not going to have you guys read these ones. I think it'll be more interesting if the person that you wrote them for never saw them. Never saw them? Yeah, so just keep these for yourself. <laughs> if you choose to share them, you can, but just not, not in this room. So the next activity is about being serendipitous. So to do this, we're going to play a game that I invented <laughs> called Daiku. And so this gets kind of interesting. This will need a piece of paper or two to float around the room. But first what I need, I need, we'll need three pieces to float around. Um, and then I need three volunteers to come up, or one volunteer. Yeah. So reach in and grab three of, three of the die without looking. Okay, so now let's see what you got. All right, okay, so we got a 20-sided die, a 6-sided die, and a 12-sided die. So the way that die coup works is that the, the type of die that you pick, the amount of sides cor corresponds to the amount of lines in the poem. So we're going to be working on a 20-line poem, a 6-line poem, and a 12-line poem. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to have one sheet of paper. Um, so if you could pass those three to me for each. Twenty side is always interesting. <laughs> this is scary. You should be so scared. So this twenty line, we're gonna we're gonna start this here with you. So hold okay. on, hold on to that for safekeeping. Don't do anything yet. And then six line, we're gonna give this to you. And then twelve line. Okay, so now the way that the Daiku game works is we already established that the amount of, number of sides corresponds to the number of lines. But then what we're going to do is we're going to alternate and keep rotating the page around line by line. Uh, and what you roll is the number of syllables that you have for that line. So I just rolled a six, so that means on line one I'm going to write six syllables. And then I'm going to give that to you, and you're going to roll the same die and keep going. So do we read what's already been written? You can. It's up to you. It's up to you. It doesn't have to relate to it all. That's part of why it's under the theme of serendipity. Mm -hmm. But um, if, if that's what you prefer, that's totally fine. And what I always say is, in terms, of, in terms of the content that you write, kind of like how we did the exercise of opening our eyes, um, just really the first thing that comes to your mind. It can be something that 
catches your attention in the room, something that maybe you overheard earlier, just some random thing you're thinking about, something you'd rather be doing right now, <laughs> anything like that. So um, these are going to be rotating clockwise. Um, and I think I'm going I'm to give you this one. Uh, this way, okay. counterclockwise. <laughs> Okay, so go ahead, and I'll be playing too. Maybe we're doing the snowball. Yeah, almost. It's a great party game. <laughs> I've done it at a party. So actually, the longer syllables tends to be easier because you just kind of write something, and then you count, and you're like, oh, okay, I'm only one or two away. That's that tends to be how I approach it. And feel free to revisit some of the other activities we did, or you. Fifteen. Okay, so one of the poems has finished, so I'm going to read it while you guys work. To begin. Let's start with making words, and then read them silently. I love pasta. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. <laughs> All right, one down. What, what, did, what did you roll that time? Uh, a, a, a 10. It oh, you got it. You got it. Oh, you have a 14. Oh, my God. Yeah, see? Good. <laughs> Here we go. Two. Oh, man. Oh, boy. Yes, that's not bad. Oh, God. 15. <laughs> All right, give it a read. All right, so. Lucky. Penny, I found you tarnished and stuck. Um, you in my deep blue pocket for good. Hi, 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 hello, hi. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go to the airport at five, in fact, at four. You have to get sneaky, sometimes okay, sense less. Sense more, sense as much as you want in your life. <laughs> and you can use it wisely if you want or not. I could really go for a huge burrito. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. That's, these are good. Yeah. Thanks. And look at they're all empty too. That says something. <laughs> okay, so while the 20 is finishing up, because there's still a backside of that guy. Um, we'll go ahead and do the final activity. And the final one is the word constrained, which a lot of these have already dealt with constraint, but I want us to actually do a snowball. Um, we talked about that for a second earlier, those ones that kind of are escalating, you know, almost look like a pyramid. So we're just going to do one together, and I actually think it'll be most fun to do it on the chalkboard, to be honest. Um, so we'll take turns going up. And there are six of us, so it should end end up having six letters. Um, but we'll do what we'll do a diamond, where it goes from one to six, and then six to one, to make it interesting. All right. Pass the baton. So you are two letters. Okay. Nice. Okay, you're going to be three letters. Too much flourish over there. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> I am why this wear outfit likes them not to see. Whoa. <laughs> I like it. Cool, guys. Well, number 20 is still going around. <laughs> but in the meantime, if there's any questions, would be happy to take them. Um, hopefully... Hopefully you enjoyed yourselves. Um, and yeah, I mean, this, there's kind of endless activities like this, but this was really supposed to represent, you know, the process of design in different ways. So um, whether or not you literally do this as you approach a social problem or a design problem is up to you, but it is, for me at least, you know, a way of kind of getting out of my head for a second and sort of expanding on a problem, trying to find patterns in a unique way, um, trying even to just kind of relax too. <laughs> um, that's, that's something I didn't bring up, but poetry is very good for stress relief as well. Um, they actually have poetry groups in the military for, for that reason, so it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, there's been a lot of talk about improv as kind of that next big you know, executive leadership tool. But um, as we've seen with some of these quotes and then hopefully with the argument that I sort of put forth, poetry can be one of those next big things too. So, mm -hmm. so hopefully you guys um, keep doing it outside of this room and um, definitely stay in touch. Show me what you make. <laughs> well, I have a question, what are, are you, you're like working on, are you working on a poetry book right now? Or what are you, yeah, are you well, working on poetry? So, yeah, so poetry personally, you know, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's funny. So I've, I've done it for a really long time. Since high school, I've been interested in poetry. So about the same time that I've been interested in design. But um, it's, it's one of those things that I never really tried to talk about much publicly. It's always just been kind of a hobby. Um, but lately I've been doing a little bit more, you know, more workshops around it, things like that. Um, I write poetry all the time. I have, a, I have a zine called Future Taco with a good friend of mine in Oregon, um, which is an experimental poetry zine that we publish every quarter as well. Um, so definitely check that out. In terms of publishing a book of poetry, I don't know if I'm quite there yet, <laughs> but that would definitely be a goal one day. That would be really fun. Um, I'd be really proud of that for sure. Yeah, but but for now it's kind of been about you know how can we how can we sort of use this type of thinking or this lens on the world to really make our design projects more interesting and our our strategic approaches mm -hmm. you know more more innovative too. Yeah. In the context of all these classes, how do you define design? Yeah, that's a good question. Though I I would define. I mean, you know, I've always, you always hear that design is, is sort of a tool for problem solving uh, and that design is visual, design is uh, strategic, you know, you hear all these things and to me I've, I've always seen design as actually a tool for seeing problems um, more so than for solving problems. A lot of the time, a lot of the times, at least in the work that I encounter, um, design, like the, the work of the designer of the design studio or whoever it might be, really isn't that last stop, um, but it does kind of illuminate a lot of the possibilities that then a client or an organization or someone on the field can really take further um, to implement or to, to kind of spark some sort of systematic change. 
Um, and I think that design's really the best tool for doing that, um, for, for figuring out what's, what's, what's broken. <laughs> you mean because the process of figuring out design-related issues mm -hmm. lead to then a creative process? Which exactly. Which is things, basically. I mean, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, it's... You hear a lot of designers say that we're that we're problem solvers, but I, I've always kind of I, I've always just kind of taken that position that we're more we're more like the troublemakers or the problem identifiers because design at the end of the day is really just one industry. There's a lot of people that solve problems way better than designers do, um, and so that that's kind of I guess what I mean by that. Yeah. Yeah. How can we? How can we? Um, how can we like kind of make invisible stuff visible mm. and then inspire others to act on that or or facilitate that there's been this through through history of looking at design there's been kind of these moments like the Mad Men era of designer as expert you know that person who's like oh you want to sell a thousand cigarettes this is exactly how you do it and then you know with with the design thinking movement there's been this kind of human centered design thing where you're not really the expert anymore, you're more, um, you still sort of are the expert, but you're more that person that's able to kind of bring communities together and work with people to see, to see stuff and then to ultimately solve it for them. But now I think we're in this exciting period where the designer is the facilitator, mm. where we're not necessarily solving the problems anymore. Like I said, we're more um, showcasing what the problems are and we're working with others to solve the problem themselves. Uh, that's, I kind of hope that design stays on that trajectory because I think it's, to be honest, it's a little bit less cocky, <laughs> you know, than, than where design's been in the past. I think, you know, design, it's, it's kind of one of those words that's kind of broken, you know, or that's, yeah. it's very confused. <laughs> it has an identity crisis because when you say design, to anybody that, and, and I mean this design thinking, strategy design kind of community, it's really small community. It's, it's not, it's getting bigger, but it's not mega mainstream. So if I go out on the street and say, hey, I'm a designer, which this happens when I first meet people, they say, oh, cool, do you make clothes or cars or, um, you know, or websites or like, what do you make? And it becomes, it starts to get kind of tiring to try to explain, to explain that. So. No, 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 but no, but I think I think that, that that kind of act of it being tiring means that maybe we we've outgrown that word. <laughs> that maybe we need something else. You know, maybe it is facilitator, maybe it's poet, you know, maybe it's dice roller. I don't really know. <laughs> Well, let's start with dice roller and see how confusing that is. Yeah, yes. yeah. yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a dice roller. <laughs> so, how do they define what they hire you for? Yeah, so when a company hires us, we we've worked pretty hard to try to have them not come to us with an assumption of, hey, I need X or I need Y or I need Z, but more hey, this is where I'm seeing kind of a bottleneck or here's where some of the problems are that I'm facing and then we can help them determine what it is that they need then. Um, so a lot of times somebody will come with us, say, come to us, say it's a nonprofit, they'll say, um, hey, we're having a really hard time fundraising or, um, hey, you know, we're not selling much to this demographic, we think maybe we need to change demographics. Uh, and then we'll kind of sit with them, consult them, um, work with them on hashing that out and then together, you know, again, not necessarily us as experts, but us as kind of, uh, you know, co-creators with the client will decide what's the best thing to do here. So I think that's part of why, you know, we really thrive working with nonprofits and startups um, because both of them really, they have this list of problems um, and they both tend to be pretty, pretty open-minded in general to different types of solutions as well. So, so that's kind of, I would say that's really where we thrive with, with you know, design and, or, or dice rolling. <laughs> and I'm going to write this final 15 syllables and I'm going to read this. 
Okay, ready? <laughs> Ooh, this is good. This is a lot of stuff. Okay, so this was a 20, 20 syllable, 20 sided die, or not 20 syllable, 20 line. Process is everywhere design, theology, and science. Landing on 15 always gets me thinking about 15. 11 is a good number that has two shoes. Sides. Sides. <laughs> I like shoes. <laughs> 11 is a good number that has two sides. And now I have the chance for 10. 10. 10. Gosh, 14 words. Wait, how many more words do I need here? Only four, four. The process continues, numbers pushing forth exhausted. 10 rhymes with hen, but who cares about hens? If you must know, hens lay eggs, and I prefer scrambled with a little milk and cheese. So how must we be how so how we must beware of major earthquakes and fault zones of California? <laughs> I don't have a backpack. I'm not prepared. Maybe I'm maybe I'll die now. <laughs> Today is a good day to die. Tomorrow would be much better. Today is one of those days you can call home and dance and sing and shout on. And you write on because this poem is long going on and on and on to now it's almost time to go, hate to go, excite, excited to take this and challenge me. My brain is filled, overflowing, blowing, a whale rising for breath. Dice rolling designers marching down streets toward heaven and hell. <laughs> nice, thanks everybody. Thank <laughs>